Good morning, Napa Valley Life Church. We're glad you're joining us today. If you would like to give or tithe to Napa Valley Life Church, there are three ways to do so. The first is giving by mail. The second is you can go to our website and give online at nvlife.org give. Or finally, on Tuesdays and Thursdays between 11 and 1 p.m., you can give in person here at the church. On Friday, May 29th at 7 p.m., we're having a drive-in hymn and prayer night. It's going to be a great night. Um, be sure to get there early for a great parking spot, and we look forward to seeing you there. Finally, if you have a prayer request, please email those to us at office at nvlife.org, and we'd love to be praying for you this week. Enjoy the service.
the crowds earnestly looked for Jesus and finally found him on the other side of the Sea of Capernaum. Just the day before, Jesus had miraculously fed all of them with only a couple loaves of bread and some fish, and while it had satisfied them at the time, they returned to him hungry. But this is why they sought Jesus so desperately, not for who he was, but because he had amazed them at what he had done. The miracle reminded them of the days of Moses, when the nation of Israel was nourished daily with bread from heaven. Perhaps Jesus, like Moses, could usher in a new age for their people. Jesus spoke to the crowd, You worked so hard to find me, but only so you could ask me for bread that satisfies a short while. Why aren't you looking for the bread that will satisfy you forever? Bread that satisfies forever? Many in the crowd began to wonder how they could get this miraculous bread from God. They asked Jesus, What works of God must we do in order to get this bread? Jesus replied, I am sent from God. Believe in me. But the crowd searched for a sign and questioned Jesus. Yes, you multiplied bread and fed thousands, but Moses brought down bread from heaven and fed millions. What great work will you do that will demonstrate that you are greater than Moses? Welcome back, church. We're so glad that you're joining us again. We're starting a new sermon series called the He Is Sermon Series. And really what we're looking at is the seven I am statements that Jesus makes in John. If you remember, we did a seven sign series before we did the Good Life series, looking at the seven uh, miracles that Jesus did. It's very similar to this because John writes in these patterns of seven. So I'm excited. Let's see who Jesus says he truly is. Before we get started in there, let's look at a hummingbird. There's a hummingbird right there. Hummingbirds are incredible. And I think probably one of the most incredible things about them is that they are required to eat every 10 minutes. It sounds awesome. They have an incredible metabolism. Their wings flap at 200 times a minute. I gotta get this right. And their heart beats 1,200 times every 60 seconds. And so they need a ton of calories to burn off all the time. So they're constantly eating, constantly eating. They actually eat, now I, I wanna get this right, they consume one half of its weight in sugar daily. That sounds similar to my diet, maybe. See, the hum hummingbird has this perpetual hunger. It never stops and it primarily needs sugar. Why? Because that's how it bo its body runs. And if we tried to give it something that wasn't sugar, like if we tried to feed a hummingbird steak, it probably wouldn't work well. It probably wouldn't equate to the energy that it needs. See, today we're looking at Jesus as the bread of life. Now, when I say that, there's this idea that we are also perpetually hunger, hungry. There, we have this hunger inside of us. And the truth is, is while we are all hungry, most of us don't know exactly spiritually what we're hungry for. And so this is what Jesus is talking about in John 6, that he is the bread of life. So let's look at this a little deeper here. Now, when we look at John, and as we looked at the seven signs series, John is not written like the other gospels that tell the story of Jesus. Instead, John is very pointed. He's trying to get to the point here. He's not just trying to give you a chronological picture of Jesus' life. Instead, in John 20, he summarizes why he writes the book. John 20, 31. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. He's writing John to tell you who Jesus is. And through that, he's hoping that you will understand him as the Son of God, as the Savior of the world. That's the purpose of John. And I would say the other Gospels too, but much more John is writing for just that purpose. And so we're looking at these seven I am statements. And today's statement is simple. And we're actually going to look at the statement for two weeks. It says this, I am the bread of life. You may have heard this before. Now, this is a weird statement to make. Anybody that looks at you and says, I am the bread of life, you go, I don't know if I fully understand that. And to be honest with you, the Jews didn't. So we need two weeks to look at this because they're going to be confused through all of this. But especially as Jesus is setting up, he makes a couple other 
large statements to lead into this statement. So let's look at that today. We're in John 6. We're looking at verses 22 through 34. And we're going to start here in verses 22. If you have a Bible from the church, it's on page 947. And it says this, The next day the crowd that had stayed on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat. They also saw that Jesus had not boarded the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone off alone. Some boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Now it's important that we understand where he's at. So a day before this, what we're looking at today, he fed the 5,000. So he was teaching, he was doing other miracles, and 5,000 people were following him. He recognizes that they're hungry, so he feeds them with a little boy's lunch. An incredible miracle. And just 24 hours, he's here. Now, in that 24 hours, at the nighttime, he leaves for Capernaum. Now, his disciples get on a boat. Uh, they experience rough seas. They get scared. And Jesus shows up walking on the water. Two major miracles in a 24-hour period. Uh, it was a long day. Let's be honest here. And now Jesus is on the other side in Capernaum. And these 5,000 people wake up, probably hungry, going, where's our food source? Where did Jesus go? They see that he's not there and they guess that he went to Capernaum. So they go and they try to find him. They try to look for Jesus. And in reality, what they're looking for is their food source. Who's going to give us breakfast? And so when they catch up to Jesus, they sit down and say, Rabbi, when did you get here? They're looking at him as a teacher. And then they have this conversation back and forth. This conversation between Jesus and this group of thousands of people. And this is the conversation that's going to lead us into these, uh, this I am statement of I am the bread of life, which we'll look at next week. Verse 25, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come? Jesus answered them, truly, truly. Now, anytime he says truly, truly, he's going to say this continually. Truly, truly. It's an important statement. It's a cornerstone statement. It says, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, because you ate, the or ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God, the God the Father has set his seal. Then he said to them, what are they said to him, excuse me, what must we do to be, be doing the good works of God? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who had sent him. So that he said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see that we believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, he says it again. I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us his bread. We're going to dig into this conversation. This conversation is infinitely important, and it's this strange conversation between Jesus and thousands of people, and they're not quite getting it, because what they recognize is that they're hungry. Jesus even looks at them and says, you are absolutely hungry, but they don't realize what they're hungry for. They think they want one thing, and they're asking Jesus for one thing, but Jesus is saying, look, what you're hungry for is different than what you actually think you need. And as we look at that today, we're all hungry, but we don't necessarily know what we're hungry for. So we're going to dig into this. We're going to look at what we think we're hungry for and how Jesus really does better than that, goes infinitely above that. So what we are hungry for and what we think we're hungry for. So let's look at that. We, what we think we're hungry for. We are hungry for God to give us physical Relief. We are hungry for God to give us physical relief. What do these Jews say? They went to him and said, Jesus, we want more food. Give us more food. And why was their reaction to? Well, the reaction was to Jesus giving them food. There were 5,000 people, more like 15,000 people, including uh, men and, or, excuse me, women and children. And Jesus fed them off of a little boy's lunch. And so they saw that and they said, Jesus, give us more food. And the response that Jesus gives them is this you got to get over the physical and start focusing on the eternal. Let's look at this a little deeper in verse 25. 
When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for food that perishes, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Now, I say this, and it seems like half-hearted jest, that these people went across the lake just to get breakfast. But the truth is, that's why they went across the lake. Jesus calls them out for it. They show up and Jesus says, look, you're just looking to fill your bellies. And he makes this truly, truly statement, this cornerstone statement, that it's not our bellies that we need to be concerned with. And so these people didn't understand the sign that Jesus had done with feeding the 5,000s. They didn't understand that the miracles that Jesus was doing was to show them, as it says in John 20, that he is God, that he is the savior of the earth. All they think of is that Jesus is our vending machine. He gives us the food that we need. And so they go to him expecting him to give them another round of physical food to get their bellies filled. And look, church, we look to Jesus to get our bellies filled all the time. Jesus, heal me. Re fill my bank account. We look to Jesus for the physical so much. As a matter of fact, that might be how you came to church or you came to Jesus. You were desperate physically. And now let me tell you this, that Jesus is concerned with your physical side. He is concerned with you getting food and surviving, but we can't be focused on the, the temporary physical and miss the eternal. This is what Jesus is saying. Because Jesus is saying, you're so focused on your belly that you're missing eternity. The marked, sealed, certified Son of the Father Jesus Christ standing before them saying, I'm here to save you. They're missing it because they're, they're hungry. Growing up, my first car was a 1984 Mazda 626. Yes, it's every bit as luxurious as you are picturing right now. And I was driving down like Havasu had hills and I was driving down this hill and my brakes locked up. I was with friends and it locked up. We were going down my actual street I lived on and my brakes locked up and they, I didn't know what to do. So I just kept pressing the gas, which caused the brakes to heat up more and more and more until finally they caught on fire in front of my house. And thank God my dad was already outside. He was able to run out, grab a hose and spray down the car that was on fire that I had just escaped from. Uh, yes, I didn't know what I was doing then. And I remember, or excuse me, I don't remember, but this would be like here with the Jews and Jesus, me looking at the car and telling my dad, hey, you know, I think I really need to get an oil change in that car. No, the car's on fire. Who cares about the oil change right now? That could happen later on or looking at him and saying, I think that car needs a car wash. No, the car is on fire. And when we focus on just our physical side, our car is on fire and we're just worried about the car getting washed. No, it's on fire. Yes, your belly may be empty, but you're dying and in desperate need of an eternal Savior. And that's Jesus standing before us. And of course, like I said before, he's concerned with our physical, with our hunger, with our pain. But we can't just live in that world alone. We can't just look at Jesus as our grocery store. Instead, we need to recognize the car's on fire and we're desperate for him. So let's look at some application of this point. Let's look at some application of this physical feed me side of Jesus. First, if you know Jesus, look to the eternal and not to just your belly. Colossians 3 one says this, If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things on this earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is at your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Don't worry so much about the physical side. Trust God for that. But instead be concerned with what the things of above of who Jesus is, of learning to be more like him. If you are watching this and you don't know Jesus, let's look for an application for you. Maybe, maybe you're wondering why you're so hungry and you haven't recognized what you're really hungry for. You might be living in the physical, but now the eternal spiritual hunger is catching up to you. And now this is where Jesus comes in because he's the only one that could fulfill that hunger for you. We're hungry. That's easy enough, right? We are asking God for physical relief. Second one is this, that we're hungry for God to give us the spiritual formula. 
How do we earn this, Jesus? All right, you said, you're talking about this eternal bread. How do we get it then? And this is the reaction to when, G, when the Jews are called out. They're having this reaction. They're questioning Jesus because he's saying, get over the physical stuff. And so they're saying, well, okay, how do we do that? What do we do at this point? Verse 28, then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. And so they're saying, okay, we want to be focused on the eternal. What do we have to do? What job do we need to take? What's the list of things we need to accomplish? And Jesus says, I'm here on the list. Just believe in me. This is all it requires. There's no earning. There's just faith. Now, to understand this, we need to understand kind of the Jewish context here because they, I don't believe, at least in this part, that they were trying to be selfish or paranoid or looking. They were just looking to what their culture would say. Hey, how do we, how do we get this eternal bread that you're talking about? Their, their whole world was follow this set of rules and be good enough and, and maybe you'll gain some righteousness which we know is not the case. And so their obtaining eternal life consisted of finding the right formula, performing the right task to please God. And it's the same question we ask often. All right, church, we want the eternal bread. What's the formula for us to get it? What are the words that we have to say in order? What's the jobs that we have to do in church? Or even more so what the culture around us says, what do we have to do? Is there a spiritual formula that looks like a cosmic scale? And if I do enough right, then I'll get to heaven. And if I don't do, an, if I don't do too many, if I don't have too many lies, or if I don't steal too many things from the store, then my cosmic scale will even out and I'll be able to get there. What's the spiritual formula? They're looking to Jesus and asking, and Jesus is saying, throw away the formula because it's simple enough. It's believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's the formula. That's the ultimate relief. The formula is simple. Believe in whom he has sent, who is Jesus Christ. We call this salvation by faith alone. Faith in Jesus Christ. Or if you want to get more fancy, we call it sola fide. Justification by faith alone. Ephesians 2, 8, and 10 say, 8 through 10 say this. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not as a result of work, so that none of you may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, with God prepared beforehand that we should walk with him. Let's go back to my Mazda 626. Now, after this, I remember having a conversation with my dad. The car is now toasted, and I look at him and I say, how do we fix it? And my dad looked at me and said, there's no, we're going to fix it of this car. There is, we throw it away and get a different car. In the same way, when we look to the spiritual formula, when we ask God for the spiritual formula, we're looking at a broken, burnt car saying, God, how do we fix it so we get good enough for you? And Jesus is saying, get rid of the car. And he's saying, you know what? You need a new car and I'll provide it for you. And it's his car. Justified means that we are justified through Christ, that he takes the death that we deserve for us. So when we are, when we look at Adam and Eve sinning in the garden, that sin goes throughout all of us. This is called total depravity, that we are sinful. All of us on the same scale. And all of us are desperate for God. Our cars are burnt and they're broken. And we're saying, hey, what's the spiritual formula? formula? And God says, look, here's my son who died on a cross because sin equates to death. But he took your death for you on that cross. Then defeated death three days later through the resurrection. This is how you get the new car. This is how Jesus takes away the old busted car and gives you the new one. And guys, please know when I'm saying this, I'm using an illustration. If you're a Christian, you don't just get a brand new car. At least it hasn't happened for me yet. What I'm saying here is that he takes our death and he gives us new life and his new life is founded in Christ. So application, if you're a Christian, John is interesting because he never uses the word faith. If you're a Christian, look at this. Other places in scripture uses faith all day long. Ephesians, um, all Galatians, they use faith all day long. But John never uses faith. Instead, he uses belief. 
And this Jewish connotation of belief would have acted as obedience. It would have equated to the word obedience. See, you are saved by Jesus alone, but then John's telling you, now go out once you are saved and obey. Show that fruit. Live your life for Christ. So if you're a Christian, yeah, believe. And believe as an action word, not just something that happened before. If you're not a Christian, we need you to know that there's no spiritual formula to make you complete. There's only Jesus, and he does. He makes you complete. He does the work for you. Stop trying to be a good person. You're not going to get there and allow Jesus to make you into the good person. Don't try to earn heaven because you'll always have red in your ledger if you do. Instead, allow Jesus to throw it away. Last thing, last thing that we're hungry for, at least we think we're hungry for, is that we think we are hungry for God to prove it. We look to Jesus after all of this and say, all right, what are you going to give us? And the Jews said it like this, what are you going to give us? Because Moses gave us some manna. And the reaction is this, when Jesus says, hey, you just have to have faith in the Son, they start getting very hesitant. They start getting worried about what Jesus is saying. And they say, hey, well, Moses gave us something. We need more of a sign. And Jesus looks at him and says, Moses gave you nothing. That God did it all for you. Let's look at this a little deeper. Verse 30, so they said to him, then what sign do you do? What may we see to believe you? This is a big statement, Jesus. Give us something a little bit more. What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the man in the, uh, in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to him, truly, truly, cornerstone statement, I say to you, it is not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Their next reaction is the most frustrating one. Jesus, prove it. Prove that if we have faith in you, we're going to get heaven. Prove it, Jesus. Look, God proved it through Moses when Moses gave us manna. They're still thinking about filling their stomachs, and they're disregarding the eternal altogether. And now let's just stop real quick, because I think we need to look at the last 24 hours of what happened in these people's life. All right, so Jesus is walking, doing miracles, and thousands of people came. Well, most likely over 10,000 people came, and they're listening to him. And Jesus sees that they're hungry. Oh, they're physically in need of food. He takes compassion on them. He takes a little boy's lunch and then provides all of them food until they're satisfied. Then the disciples go out on the sea, and Jesus takes a nice little jaunt over a stormy sea. Yes, walking on water. And then the people go to find him to get more food. And when Jesus tells them, look, you need more, they say, prove it, Jesus. You haven't quite done enough in the last 24 hours. Yeah, that feeding us and then also walking on the sea, that's not so much. They have the audacity to tell Jesus to prove it. Give us more stuff. Moses gave us manna and we're still hungry. Give us some more food. But the crazy part is, is their audacity is the same as ours. We're no better. We haven't changed in the last 2,000 years. How often do we cry out to God, prove it? Give me more stuff. Prove it, God. And forget about what God has already blessed you with. And so you might be saying, look, my life is terrible. What did God bless me with? And look, I'm not pretending to know your life. I don't know the conditions of your life. I don't know how bad it is for you. I know that God has taken mercy on you and loves you and suffers alongside of you. But I don't know how bad it is. But I can tell you a few things. If you call yourself a follower of Jesus, meaning that you are a Christian, that you are blessed beyond measure, that it says in his scripture that you are his masterpiece, that Jesus Christ came and died on a cross for you, that he knows every hair on your head and he built ye all of creation for you. All of this is for you. James 1.16 says it best, Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of his first fruits of creation. We are blessed beyond measure, but we have the audacity to look at a God that historically has provided for us and say, prove it. Prove it. 
look at his reaction. I think it's one of the best reactions we see in Scripture. He looks at them and says, look, Moses gave you nothing. Let's read that again, a matter of fact. Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. He looks at them and says, everything you're putting, giving to Moses is nothing because it was God who gave you the bread. It was God who gave you the manna. It had nothing to do with Moses. This was God. And that was just him giving you some bugs to eat. Now he's giving you eternal life, which is so much more important than the bugs that you were given before. So let's apply this. If you're a Christian, God has nothing to prove to you. He proved it when he got on the cross. Wake up daily reminding yourself of this in your life. What does that mean? Well, let's look at the trace decay theory a little bit. The trace decay theory states that forgetting occurs as a result of an automatic decay or fading of the memory trace. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. What it's saying here is decay, loss of memory, happens when we do not remind ourselves of what's going on. That we forget it if we stop reminding ourselves. Let's give you a for instance here. We are all stuck inside our houses and it feels like we forgot what it was to be outside, to give a handshake, to embrace someone with a hug. It feels like that is foreign. Why? Because that memory has not been rethought of again. We can't remind ourselves of what it physically means to hold someone's hand or give them a hug. And so we start to lose that memory. The trace decay theory would say that it starts to fade away because it's not continually being reminded of. And this theory suggests that short-term memory can only hold for 15 to 30 seconds unless it's rehearsed over and over again. Church, you will forget the blessings of God and ask God to prove it unless you continually remind yourself of what God, Christ did for you, of what God did for you by hanging on that tree. Remind yourself daily that he loved you so much that he died for you and resurrected for you and that he's waiting for you. This all of creation is for you. Remind yourself of it because you'll forget about it. And then you look to God, just like these Jews did, and said, prove it, God. For the, non, for the non-Christians, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there is a God that is madly in love with you. And he proved it through being on the cross. He loves you dearly. Embrace him. As we finish up, let's look at simply verse 34, because then they get to another reaction that seems to make sense. Jesus outlines it. They're saying, we don't really believe this. Give us some more signs. And then, Jesus, and then they said to Jesus, sir, give us this bread always. Now, we're going to look next week. They continue this conversation, and guess what, church? I'm going to give you a little preview. They don't get it. They still don't get it. Sir, give us this bread always. They missed everything that Christ had because they continually thought about filling their stomachs. It was the only hunger that they were concerned with. Church, if we're going to understand this idea of bread of life, then we have to stop being worried about the bread in our life. Yes, Jesus cares about your physical condition, but he cares about your eternal salvation so much more. As a matter of fact, in Matthew 9, Jesus is going through this, Matthew 9, 1 through 8, and he's about to heal a man, but he does something interesting. Let's look at it. And getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to to themselves, This man's blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. And he said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. Look. Jesus is concerned about your physical side. He wants you to have healing. He wants all of that, and it's all according to his will. But he's so much more concerned with your eternal salvation, with the fact that he wants you to know that he died for you. And our hunger is only satisfied when we continually bask in the glory of the faith that we have in Christ. This is the only way we can be satisfied. Look, this physical side... It's either going to be destroyed or glorified in the end. 
but our eternal salvation is so much more. And so like a hummingbird looking for sugar, it starts with us understanding what we're truly hungry for. John Piper says the best when he says this, if we don't feel strong desires for the manifestation of the glory of God, it is not because you have drunk deeply and are satisfied. It is because we have nibbled so long at the table of the world, our soul is stuffed with small things and there's no room for great. Church, get rid of everything else on your table and go to God and say, I'm hungry for you. Fill my table with that because I know it's the only way we'll be satisfied is when we're satisfied in the bread of life. Let's pray. Lord, you are so good. And we thank you for providing us with the bread of life. We thank you, Lord. We don't understand it. And we get consumed with our bellies so often, with the physical side so often, Lord. And I ask you, help us to step out of that and be concerned with eternity so much more than the temporal. Help us be to remind ourselves daily of what you did for us when you died on that cross. Help us to be satisfied by the bread of life and not look for anything else. Maybe you're, a, maybe you're not a Christian and you want to become one and you don't know quite how to do that, what that means or what that even implies in your life. You can email me at tony at envylife.org and we can have a conversation about it. That's unfortunately the easiest way to do it right now um, as far as us talking. You can also pray out to your Savior and say, Lord, I'm ready to follow you. I'm ready to believe and obey. I'm ready to be saved by faith alone. You don't need me to do that. It just requires you to call out. Lord, we thank you and we love you. Let us continually be satisfied in the bread of life. In your precious and holy name, amen. Fully known and love.